to the comic shop I'll let you read about Cyclops I'll have you spending all you got Comic skate is looking hot Blacklist Hello once again to all you beautiful people in Webtown. Left hand legit. Back in the house, ready to talk to you about more totally awesome comic books that move the needle. And if we were ever, ever to find some comic books that move the needle, it would be the comics we're gonna talk about over the next few days. We are beginning a very special series that is going to really, really show you what it means to move the needle, what it means to make comic book fans wait with bated breath for the comic book you're about to release. And this series covers the absolutely phenomenal crossover from 1992, The Executioner's Song. This crossover ran through all of the X-Men books and it promised that it would reveal the origin of my boy Cable right there who's standing over a, a prone Professor X. This ran in the Uncanny X-Men, this ran in X-Factor, X-Men, X-Force. It was 12 parts plus one addendum book, and we're gonna go through all of them here on Testosterone Overload so that you understand exactly what it means to what? To move the needle. Now, we are obviously going to begin with part one. There are cards that came in each of these polybagged comics. We'll go through the cards afterward in a separate video. And they all feature uh, Strife's uh, opinions on these characters. So that's kind of fun. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. To give you a little bit of history on the Executioner's Song, the popularity of the X-Men franchise had reached a level unheard of at this time. You had X-Men number one, which we have reviewed previously by Jim Lee that sold an incredible 8 million copies. X-Force number one that had sold an incredible 5 million copies. And then you had, you had those great creators leave. Wills Portacio, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee. They all took off and they formed Image Comics which was really, you know, the buzz of 1992, without a doubt. Marvel needed to do something to counter that. Well, it turns out that at a writer's retreat held by the X-Men writing staff in early 92, the writers planned the direction for the franchise, and they decided a massive crossover would be the best way to go about keeping fans involved with this X franchise. The crossover would deal with uh, the X-Men and all the different X-Teams facing their biggest enemies at that time, which would have been Strife, Apocalypse, and Mr. Sinister, the three big baddies. Magneto was dead at this moment in time. Uh, there was an original idea to bring Magneto back, but that, that did not happen until uh, a little bit later on, uh, past the Executioner's song. A year prior to this, in 1991, it was it was implied that Cable was the son of Cyclops and Madeline Pryor, the fake Jean Grey. Meanwhile, my boy Strife had also revealed that he had the same face as Cable, so one of them was clearly a clone of the other. This was so popular. This was hugely popular. Let me show you how popular this was. The speculative market believed that this crossover was going to completely change the face of the X books, and so it was highly sought after. It was believed that it was going to be worth so much in the future because Cable was so immensely popular, and, you know, really, like, this character you could probably credit with uh, the rise in popularity of comic books along with Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man number one. Um, man. Cable really did, really did bring in a whole new generation of comic book fans. And, uh, and how popular was this comic? How much did the speculators believe that this was going to be worth, you know, $50 or $100 in the future? Well, to the point where I still have quite, 
quite a few of these guys, like <laughs> quite a few, quite a few. And we'll talk about what I'm gonna do with these afterwards. I think some of you longtime viewers uh, have an idea what we could do with all these polybagged executioner songs, part one. But anyway, let's get right into this comic book. It starts with Warren Worthington III, the angel. He's no longer the angel, he is now Archangel. But you, I know what you're saying, you know, how could he be Caucasian with the blonde hair, the, the Archangel's blue with the metal wings? Well, we'll get into that. He was born Warren Worthington III, heir to one of the world's largest private fortunes. Sometime during puberty, shortly after his 13th birthday, huge feathered wings grew from his back. After a brief career as a local Long Island superhero, he did what any confused adolescent mutant would do. He joined the X-Men. Over the years, he's lost all of his family, most of his fortune, and his original wings. The only thing which hasn't changed about him, even after his transformation into the shadow-hued, wild-eyed creature of the night known as the Archangel, is that Warren Worthington III is one heck of a date. Madam, your chariot awaits. We have absolutely stunning art by Brandon Peterson in this gem of a comic book. And of course, you know, here's the chick. Warren, you, you're late? My, my apologies, Charlotte. I was gonna say you're white. What? Let's see how he deals with that. Ah, there you go again, using that police training. No wonder you passed your detective exam. Nothing gets by you, Sergeant Jones. If you're through, mm, I thought we were going to the One World Harmony concert in the park. Aren't you a little overdressed? I don't think so, no. But if you do, I'm sure we can arrange something. And then he just immediately goes in for that kiss. And the window starts to go up to the park, James. Very good, sir. You can say that again, James. Freaky deaky. So then we get to the Central Park, New York City, and this is the concert. This is the One World Harmony concert. And we have a, a bishop who is somewhat antiquated with those glasses on his face. I don't know, I like to sometimes call those the Malcolm X glasses. Sometimes I, I imagine them as uh, the Nazi glasses that, that the bald dude wore in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. They do have, they are those glasses, aren't they? Savage Dragon also wears these glasses. There must be 75,000 people here. What's wrong, sugar? They don't hold free rock concerts in the future? That's not what I'm complaining about, Rogue, and you know it. How are we supposed to maintain any security parameter around the professor under these conditions? Believe it or not, Bishop, the X-Men managed to function as the mutant team supreme long before you stumbled into Camp Xavier to tell us peons how it's done. Why do I get the impression you're still angry about that blueberry pie incident? Please, I'm above that sort of thing. I don't even know what you're talking about. Besides, it was boysenberry. And you're going to want to check out X-Men number 8 to, to understand what that means. I'm up next, Charles. Are you sure the masses are ready for this? Ready to listen to the call for brotherhood? For peaceful coexistence between humans and mutants? Not at all, Lila. But if mankind waited for the right time to address the winds of change, it's unlikely we'd ever have crawled from the primordial ooze. 20 yards below the stage. They'll be raking Charles Xavier's mutant-loving bones off the great lawn for a month. Not to mention those Lila Cheney's makeup woman who tipped us off to the professor's unscheduled appearance. Every cause has to have its martyrs, Anita. We'll mourn her at next week's meeting. Sorry, friends. Boom! Cable just kills two human beings who are plotting to blow up the professor. I've got first dibs on Professor X. If it means anything, I may take a little longer, but it'll be just as dead. Obviously, you can see this is the overture, written by Scott Lobdell, drawn by Brandon Peterson, inks by Terry Austin. Then we cut to Salem Center, Westchester. We're at the Danger Pub. Cy Cyclops is uh, just hanging out here at Harry's Hideaway, you know, thinking about the past and what happened in Wolverine number 57 with Mariko's death. The difference being I never should have supported out, support a group outside the team. All my friends are X-Men. All my loves are... And like he imagines, you know, the, the beer chick is turning into Psylocke here. This is supposed to be Psylocke. It doesn't look like her, but it's supposed to be purple hair, you know, could 
gives it away. I was actually confused a little bit at this part, but they explain it a little bit later. Um, and then Jean, of course, comes in, and she's like, you're thinking about her again, aren't you? Her? I'm, I'm thinking of you, Jean. I'm always thinking of you. Don't lie to a telepath, Scott. It's demeaning. And we cut to the supermarket where Bobby and Colossus, so Iceman and Colossus, are, are buying food. Uh, we have an unfortunate ink smear right there. And they're talking about women. Um, Opal said she needs time alone to think things through. Ouch. Ouch. Needs time alone to think, thing, to think things through, Peter? Is womanese, for we're broken up, and I don't want to tell you. Womanese. I see. There's no chance she's being sincere. Hmm. I, I hadn't thought of that. Try, Robert. Meanwhile. We call him Robert Cop. Try, Robert Cop. Meanwhile. Read me the name of those pork rinds Logan asked us to buy. My love life is coming apart at the seams, and I'm shopping for pork rinds. Wait. Oh, but I thought he was gay. Oh, I guess he, he wasn't gay back then. You know, or he was just, you know, this was his beard. He's trying to, you know, cover so no one would know. Because mutants were so judgmental of homosexuality in the 90s, I guess. I don't know. Ask Cena Grace. <sighs> shopping for pork rinds. Life is unfair that way. No, he would know. Pete, you and I don't have a lot of history between us, but if... But if I'd like to pour my heart out about my brother's suicide... But if I'd like to pour my heart out about my brother's suicide, you'll listen? Thank you, no. My grief, my shame, Tavrash, is a private matter. And this is in the last issue. Peter's brother committed suicide. That's pretty devastating. I missed that one. Oh! There it is, man. Spider-Man X-Men. This game was... Too hard for me. I could not beat this. I owned it, and I could not beat it. I just gave up eventually, because it was too difficult. So now we have Gambit and Aurora, who are on guard, basically, at the concert to make sure nothing happens, and he's making her laugh and giggle. And then we cut to the Grand Wyatt Hotel, where X-Factor is staying, and here we see Jamie Madrox uh, doing his little Congo dance as the multiple man. There's Guido, the strong man, and there's Quicksilver. And they're just, you know, having a little fun conversation. Mm -hmm. Not important. Meanwhile, at Harry's, uh, because I have nothing to apologize for. How can you say that? Or is this ability to drool whenever Psylocke enters the room some new mutant power of yours? She's a woman, Jean. An exceptionally gorgeous and sexy one at that. I'm a man who's been in love with you from the moment we met. <laughs> After all, we've been through, you know what? And this broad here, how many times has she fantasized about Logan, huh? How many times? And she's been out of shape over him finding Psylocke attractive, typical. After all we've been through, you're willing to let jealousy jeopardize what we have? Of course not. No, it's just, after what happened with Aurora and Forge, I'm just so afraid the same thing will come between us. There's a lot of relationship stuff going on in this comic. Afraid. Afraid is good. And then he just sucks her face off right here. Unlike Forge, I have everything I need. Everything I've ever needed. Right here in my arms. I don't see a cup of soy in his arms, so maybe I'm confused. Just, just Logan's girl. Ah, true love. I hate true love. Gene, look out. Good Lord, Caliban. So Caliban shows up, and he's just incensed, but then we cut back to Central Park. Good writing. I appreciate that. I like cutting off the scene so it leaves us hanging. That's good. That's good stuff. Thank you, New York. You don't need Lila Cheney to tell you this concert. This entire city is about celebrating diversity. This entire comic book company is about celebrating diversity. Race, creed, religion, it's all one world. Well, let me tell you, there's Scott Lobdell, writer of X-Men, uncanny X-Men. Um, yes, race, creed, religion, we are all on one world. Um, but some religions uh, don't believe in this philosophy, uh, buddy. Um, and I don't want to go into a dissertation on that, but 
Uh, I don't appreciate your uh, ignorance towards uh, what's going on in the world, even back then in 1992, when America was a much safer place and uh, wasn't concerned about celebrating diversity because Americans are all the same thing, Americans. And we appreciate the things that make us unique, but we hold closest the things we have in common, not the things that make us different, because ultimately the things that make us different are the things that people will use to tear us apart. Lila Cheney, Scott Lobdell. In the spirit of that unity of brotherhood and harmony, I'm proud to introduce a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Charles Xavier, the world's foremost expert on the world's most feared and hated minority. Mutants? That Lila always pushing the envelope. Give him a chance. Let him speak. You believe this? Shoot the mutant loving gimp. And the cherry rode in on. Okay, so we're. Wow. I'm making fun of handicapped people here. Excuse me. Disabled. Shh. It's rare that a man has the opportunity to deliver his own eulogy. So Cable's like hell bent on killing Xavier. Back in Salem Center. Uh, they noticed that uh, things are going crazy over at Harry's, which is just right across the street from where they were shopping for food. And they, so they instantly turn into their, you know, they use their mutant abilities and turn into Iceman and Colossus. And I don't know why his clothes rip other than that it makes for a cool image. I don't think he gets larger when he turns into Colossus. I think he just turns to metal. Um, so they go to, to jump into the, uh, to the fight. And uh, it turns out that there's some other guys there to fight. And so this is famine and this is war. And what are they all about? In the name of evolution, we claim your worthless lives on behalf of our Lord and Master. For you and your ilk are the weak, plagued by conscience and concern for the vermin that is humanity. Know then that your actions dictate you were born only to perish under the hooves of the horsemen of apocalypse. What? Freak. Flat scan, dead end, gene joke, mutey, words, powerful words, meant to disdain, meant to distance, to demean, to destroy the havens of self-respect we each carry and nurture within us. Just as surely as they seek to rend the centuries-old tapestry we, as a race, have agreed to call civilization. These words carry us away from the light and lead us marching, no, charging, into a darkness where prejudice and bigotry reign. Ugly, hateful words as weapons and words that ultimately fail to achieve their intended purpose. This concert is about embracing our uniqueness, the color of a man's skin, the choice of whom we love, the right for your neighbor to pursue his individual religious observance, isn't it also about learning to respect the person born with a torso fin, cursed with an optic blast, or blessed with the natural powers of telekinesis? Seeing past their differences, humans and mutants share a common unbreakable bond. No amount of words or derision, distrust or disinformation can change the truth that each of us, man, woman, black, Hispanic, Jew, Asian, Native American, homosexual, mutant, everyone, Underneath all the words, we are related. We are all family. No family. I know if you got scales growing on our faces. I know. If, I know if got scales. This is something weird going on with this line of dialogue. But let's go back to what Chuck is talking about. And let's try to modernize this. Nazi. A Republican. Trumpkin. Comics Gator, words, powerful words, meant to distance, meant to demean, to destroy the havens of self-respect we each carry and nurture within us. Just as surely as they seek to rend the centuries old tapestry, we, as a race, have agreed to call civilization. These words carry us away from the light and lead us marching, no charging, into a darkness where Tim Doyle reigns. Ugly, hateful words as weapons 
and words that ultimately failed to achieve their intended purpose. See, the purpose of those words, Nazi, Republican, Trumpkin, alt-right, those words, they fail to achieve their intended purpose. They fail to stop Ethan Van Skyver from making a living. Instead, those words helped him make $450,000 because all of us muties in Comicsgate, we aligned, we got together behind Uncle Ethan and we supported him and we will continue to support him and each other until the end of time because we don't need Tim Doyle's words. We don't need Tim Doyle calling us a Nazi or a freak or a Trumpkin or a flat scan or alt-right or a gene joke. Comicsgate is about embracing our uniqueness, not the color of our skin, not the choice of whom we love, not our religious differences. It's about embracing the uniqueness of America where people, despite all these different uniqueness, unique things, can come together, can come together as Americans, as comic book fans, and change the world, change the comic book industry, change America itself into the place it once was, into the place it will be again, a loving nation filled with compassionate people who care about each other the way that all of those mutants at Charles Xavier's school for gifted youngsters care about each other. The right for Ethan Van Skyver to pursue his individual comic book career. Isn't it also about learning to respect the person who voted for Donald Trump, who voted for Jill Stein, who voted for Gary Johnson? Seeing past our differences, Republicans and Democrats share a common, unbreakable bond. No amount of SJWs, of derision, distrust, or disinformation from Tim Doyle can change the truth that each of us, Mitch Breitweiser, Elizabeth Breitweiser, Tim Lim, John Mallon, Brett R. Smith, that umbrella guy, Yellow Flash. Despite all of those words, we are all related. We are all family. We are all Comicsgate. But I digress. At least I can see the difference in skin color. Mutants can hide anywhere. Trumpkins can hide anywhere. Save your speech for the ASPCA concert. Grow some hair, you mutie lover. Warren, I'm, I'm sorry. Don't be Charlotte. We had to try. It's Mitch Breitweiser right there, giving it a go with that red rooster on Indiegogo. Bram! He blows him up, dude. I mean, he just shot Charles Xavier, and it's brutal, and it's out of nowhere. Someone shot Professor Xavier. This guy in this Han Solo, red Han Solo jacket. The name's Cable. But the world will know me as the man who saved tomorrow. Which is a great title for a comic book. Cable, the man who saved tomorrow. Meanwhile, back at Harry's, they're still fighting the big boy, Caliban. Do not lie to me, Summers. You know, he's like, Apocalypse is dead, Caliban. I killed him myself. Isn't it time you got back to living your own life? Do not lie to me, Summers. I'm not the frightened and lonely Caliban this and Caliban that who used to nip at X-Factor's heels. I am about power now. The power to draw strength from fear. Fear, say, of commitment. He's getting involved in the interpersonal relationship there of Jean Grey and Scott Summers, and I find that humorous. Caliban has been alone for as long as Cal, for as long as I can remember. I. God, this is great. I can't be afraid of losing something I never had. Scott, he's so emotionally charged. I can barely hold him in a telekinetic grip. He's already shrugged off my optic blast. I've never seen anyone shrug off Cyclops' optic blast, so you know Caliban's a badass. Oh my god, I hate Tom DeFalco's stupid bullseye. So now he's got, uh, he's got him down on the ground. Ha, ah, Caliban is a name Callisto created. 
meant to keep me in my place, firmly beneath her feet. In all the time we spent together, in the months I was part of your family, you never once asked my real name. But all that's behind us now, because I no longer answer to Caliban, I am the fourth horseman of Apocalypse. I am death. By the master! Famine. Autumn. What have they done to you? And you're just like, what have they done? What is happening here? This just jumped from here to here. And I'm not even familiar with famine in the first place. So this just, it's like out of nowhere. She must have tried to use her emaciation power on Colossus to see if she can suck. She can suck the life out of you. Because he doesn't need food in his armored form, she was forced to feed off herself. Literally. So basically she like like went all anorexic, like too anorexic to the point where I just turned her into a skeleton. And I don't, I just, I don't, I don't know. They should have had a panel before this one that showed her doing her thing, but they didn't. I swear on the ancient bones of apocalypse. If you've hurt her, you already threatened us with death war. See, cause his name is war. It's a terrible name. Think maybe peaked too soon in the shallow epitaphs department. <laughs> waka waka waka. So, you know, War's really upset and they're gonna fight, but Colossus, you know, knocks the hell out of him in a very impactful piece of art by Brandon Peterson. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jerry Rice, for another Super Bowl for the San Francisco 49ers. Self high five. And then Warren is just like, I'm done. And he just like, he's got this little thing in his pocket. And she click, Warren? An image inducer? Does, does a detective for the police really know what an image inducer is? And sure enough, like it turns him back into his blue self. Cable! We should have taken you down after you shanghaied your first new mutant. But the professor believed they'd come to their senses on their own. Not his first mistake, Archangel. Guaranteed it's his last. And so, you know, he just like blasts Warren, you know, and hits him in the wings. Ching. And Charles, he's dying, and Charles... Charles, you were correct, Bishop, we should never... Never what, child? Never hoped? Never dared to... dream? Oh, God! Storm! Bishop, we're losing him! You've already lost him. You just don't realize it yet. Body slide by one. Celebration bound. So he's... he's out. New Mexico. Temporary home for the renegade band of mutant youths called X-Force. Sticking your nose into my transistors is not what I... Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm doing the wrong voice. Sticking your nose in my transistors is not what I thought you meant when you offered me a hand with converting the comm board. Sorry, Taya. Uh, I guess I'm just so... Ea? E oh. Oh. I get it. Sorry, Taya. I guess I'm just so eager to see Lila's face again. I'm just so eager. Police. I'm gagging here. You got Boom Boom and Warpath and Sunspot and Richter sitting around a campfire. And another time and place, they would have been the next generation of X-Men. Things didn't work out that way. Here you go, Sam. Gather around, clan. Tis showtime. We're getting a picture, but where's the sound? Give it just a second, Mr. Guthrie. Even without the words, I think we all get the basic idea. Only moments ago, by the end of Dying Final. Okay, so basically, he like, puts over Cable as the killer, and they're just, like, shocked. The sound kicks out. The silence is deafening. Yet, if they listen closely, these mutants, indeed, every mutant on the face of the Earth, might hear the faint strands of music just beyond the horizon. The Executioner's song has begun. Switch off Cerebro! Dry dock the Blackbird! Lock the danger room door. From here on, it's manic mutant mania in the mighty Marvel Manor as we continue what we're betting is the hottest crossover ever. Join us in X Factor number 84 on sale next week for chapter two. So there we go. Oh, what do we got here? Oh, Fleer. Oh, is that Game Genie again? So I just want to say the Executioner song part one Uncanny X-Men number 294, written by Scott Lobdell, drawn by Brandon Peterson, was quite excellent, despite the, the, the mild calls for diversity. Uh, this was a really enjoyable comic book to read, actually. And I am very excited to get to the Executioner's Song, part two, 
in the next video from Testosterone Overload.